Over the last several weeks, we've been telling this story over and over about the Dust Bowl era farmers out in the panhandles of Oklahoma and Texas who found themselves faced with a difficult decision. Um, Years of drought had had left them down to the last little bit of wheat seed that they had left. And they had to make a decision between either using that seed to feed their families or sowing that seed into their fields in hopes of reaping a harvest. And thankfully, many of those families chose to sow what they had out into their fields. And in 1939, uh, the rains came and a great harvest was reaped. And it, it, it enabled them not only to feed their families, but also to save their farms and ultimately to secure their future. And that those farmers who chose, uh, rather than to keep and to hang on to what they had, uh, they chose to sow it out into their fields. They were able to actually help other people and to share that with other people who were in need. Uh, Here's my contention. For us as believers in Jesus Christ as a church, God has been so good to us. We get to enjoy the riches of his kindness, the blessings of being citizens of his kingdom. Like God has been so good to us and we have a decision that we have to make as a church. Um, Will we keep those things for ourselves and just enjoy, right, what God's given us or will we choose to sow those seeds back into the kingdom, to invest those and to share those things with other people that they too might experience a harvest in their life. And over the last six weeks, we've, been, we've just been encouraging you to sow your life into the kingdom of God, that you would invest your time and your talents and your treasure into God's kingdom and trusting him to bring a harvest through you. And, and maybe for you, you're here and you have family members and you're like, God, I would love to see a harvest in their lives. Or maybe you have friends or you have neighbors or there are people in our community that you're like, God, I would just love to see you do in them what you've done in me. And maybe that's because God is asking you to share what you have with them. Throughout this series, we first of all, we're we're talking to you about the six practices of a disciple. And these six practices are are simply how we follow Jesus as a church. The first thing that we ask you to begin to do, the first habit we've asked you to establish in your life is that of devoting yourself daily to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you will abide in me and I in you, your life will bear much fruit. So if you first of all want to see a harvest in and through your life, spend time each and every day devoting yourself to Jesus Christ, spending time in his word and walking with him in prayer. The second thing we've asked you to do to make a priority in your life is gathering consistently with the body of Jesus Christ for worship. We want you to gather as the body here and and not just to consume what is offered from the stage, but rather you would come here every week as a contributor saying, what can I offer to my church? And so you come early and you encourage men and women and you pray with people that need to be prayed with. And maybe you serve in one of our ministries. You offer yourself in service to the church as a church church offers themselves in service to you that we all might be built up. The third thing that we ask you to do is to commit yourself to community. That means you seek to develop deep, rich, abiding relationships with other believers, with men and women who say, I'm going to chase after Jesus and I want you to do it right alongside me. And if I happen to fall down, I need you to pick me up and I'll do the same for you. So you invest in these deep, rich, abiding relationships with other believers. The fourth thing we've asked you to do is to serve faithfully. And that means that whether you're gathered here in this building or you find yourself out in the community, that you would serve other people as Jesus Christ has served you, offering yourself as a living sacrifice to him. God, uh, wherever I am, I recognize that rather than coming and reigning as a king, you became the servant of all who was obedient even unto death. And if I'm following you, I'm going to be serving other people. And last week, we asked you to begin giving sacrificially of all that God has given you to sow that into his kingdom, to offer God what you have and trust him to multiply that for his work in his kingdom. Now, today, we're going to be asking you to engage missionally. And what we mean by that is that you would take the good news of Jesus Christ, that you have heard the gospel, the hope of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and he did so that he might atone for your sins and invite you into a relationship with him, that you might not walk in empty and broken sin in this life, but instead you might live out the abundant life available to us in Christ Jesus 
And when we ask you to engage missionally, that means that you begin to see that you're not here on this earth merely to work a job or to be a mom or a dad or a student, that that the relationships that you have and the circumstances that you find yourself in are not by chance, but rather that God has created you and he has placed you in this world, in the family that you're in, in the friend group that you're in, the classroom that you're in, the workplace that you're in, and he's done so that you might be a missionary, that you might share the hope of Jesus Christ with the people who are ultimately in your circle, that you could be a witness there. Now, y'all, I have a pretty unique opportunity here. I don't know how many of you know me, but I actually grew up in this church. My parents moved to Poto from uh, Hodgen. We, we, uh, I moved a little closer, we moved town, y'all, uh, when we moved to Poto. And uh, we began to attend what was then, it was Emmanuel Baptist Church. It was in a kind of a janky old building in the middle of Poto back then. And y'all, I got to watch. I remember being a little kid and watching as my mom walked the aisle and gave her life to Jesus Christ. And I got to watch as Jesus began to transform her and my dad both as they began to seek after Jesus Christ. And it wasn't that long after that God began to draw my heart to faith in Jesus. And I was a little bitty kid. I remember the pastor had to set me up on the edge of the baptistry so that anyone could even see me uh, when I was getting baptized. And y'all, I watched God do that over and over and over in our church. And it was individuals, and it was couples, and it was families, and it was kids my age, and God was just doing an extraordinary work. There was a group of men and women who were sacrificing their time and their resources and their energy. Um, I I had, I I don't know how they did it, men and women who kept up with me in Sunday school, they taught me when I didn't want to learn. You know what I mean? It was difficult, right? But they invested in me, and they encouraged me along the way. People prayed for me as I was growing up in this body of believers. When I was 17 years old, I don't know why God was doing this. I didn't understand at the time. God uh, told me I needed to volunteer my summer working for this church. And, and I did. Um, I cleaned out flower beds for old ladies, did maintenance work around here, helped with vacation Bible school. And I didn't realize at the time, but that was the beginning of God's call on my life to serve the church vocationally. Uh, back in the 1990s, there was a group of men and women who sacrificed very deeply. And they, they had a vision that God had given them for a new facility, no longer in the janky old building in the middle of Poto, but to move out here uh, where we'd have room for all of the people that God had been working in their lives and families. I remember God growing and moving and transforming people in this congregation. I remember starting off in full-time ministry. I was serving in the church in Arkansas and hearing uh, that this church had really, it had dwindled, it had been some, some difficult times, a very difficult season for our church. And I think there were only about 100 people gathering here at one point. And I remember when God opened the door for me to come back and serve this church. I'm being so excited to get to invest back in many of the people that had invested in me. And over the last 15 years, we have seen God do miraculous things over and over and over. And many of you prayed and sacrificed with us as we went from uh, one service and then added additional services. And that meant that you had to stay at church twice as long, right? And you had to serve. And Sundays were far more exhausting. And many of you prayed with us, invested with us when we were going to plant another church in another city in in, in Pecola. And what started off with seven people, they now run over 100 people there in Pecola. And a new church has been birthed and established there. Many of you prayed and served and invested with us as we sent our first full-time missionaries overseas to China. Y'all, God has been doing extraordinary things in this church, and I'm just thankful. And maybe that's your story too. Maybe you came to faith in this church, and you were saved and baptized here. Maybe it's been your family that's been transformed. Maybe in recovery you found freedom from addiction or brokenness that you've carried with you for much of your life. Maybe for you, your marriage has been restored in the midst of our marriage ministry. But no matter who you are and where you've come from, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, we all stand on the shoulders of those who went before us, of men and women who prayed for us, who loved us when we weren't super lovable, who chose to speak the truth of God's word to us, to share the gospel with us when that was really uncomfortable, right? It's difficult to to break out and share that, but somebody did that for us. Every single one of us in this room, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are standing on the shoulders of someone who has gone before you, someone who invested in you, who loved you and sacrificed for you. 
So here we are as a church. And God has blessed us richly. And we have experienced a harvest here. And the question I want to ask you is, what are we going to do with what God's given to us? Previous generations took what they had and they offered it to God. They invested their lives into the kingdom. And we get to celebrate today what God has done. So again, the question, what are we going to do with what God has given to us? Are we going to take it and keep it for ourselves? Or are we going to sow back into God's kingdom and pray for an even greater harvest? You know how it works in, in the harvest field, right? The more seed that you sow, uh, the more plants are going to grow up. And ultimately, the, the greater the harvest is going to be reaped. Uh, church, I believe that God has given us much. And there is an opportunity here to see God do things that are beyond what we could even imagine. Again, the question, what will we do with what God has given to us? In Hebrews chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews takes us through, if you've read much of the Old Testament, um, he takes us through what's known as the hall of faith. And he just kind of walks through people in the Old Testament that lived lives of extraordinary faith before God. They just trusted him. They walked in obedience. And so you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. You have Moses, surely you all know Moses, right? I mean, these are men that trusted God in, in spite of really difficult circumstances. I mean, Moses went before Pharaoh. You know, you go before like the, this all-powerful Pharaoh, and you're just a guy. And he's like, hey, God said that you need to let my people go. There's no way that was going to happen, right? But then God did this extraordinary miracle, and he leads his people out of slavery in Egypt across the, the sea on dry land. I mean, it was extraordinary what God did. And as you read throughout uh, Hebrews chapter 11, it's story after story after story of men and women who followed God in faith. And God did extraordinary things. Now, not all of those people got to see all of the benefits of their faithfulness before God. I mean, some of them died before they got to experience it. Moses died in the wilderness before he saw the promised land. But woman after woman and man after man, they followed Jesus in faith. And God did extraordinary things. And y'all, we have an even greater story than they had in Hebrews chapter 11. Because not only do we have the, the saints of old, right, of the Old Testament, I mean, we have the people who've invested in our lives. And we've seen the outcome of their way of life, of their faith and their investment in the kingdom. We've got to experience that in and of ourselves. So in Hebrews chapter 12, in verse 1, the writer says, Therefore, remember all those people who have gone before us, and you've seen their way of life. And you've seen how God used them in extraordinary ways, how they followed Jesus in faith, even when they didn't know how it was going to turn out. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which so, so closely, I'm sorry, which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Today, I want to talk to you about what it looks like for us to engage missionally and to invest our lives in order to see a future harvest. What would it look like for us to invest in the next generation as the prior one did for us? So here in this passage, the first thing that I want you to see if we are going to run the race that God has marked out for us and be the people that God has called us to be, if we are going to live those extraordinary lives of faith where we see God work through us and produce a great harvest among our church and in our community and hopefully around the world, if we're going to do that, the first thing we've got to do is watch that we don't get weighed down. How do we engage missionally, invest to see a future harvest? Number one, we lay aside every weight. And I don't know about you, um, when I think about running, I actually talked to Josh Schneider this morning, and he told me he ran 50 miles yesterday. I thought he was talking about biking, uh, but he ran 50 miles in the rain yesterday. And I, as I think about that, I'm like, man, there's just no way. I'm never going to run 50 miles. I'm not sure I even want to. Uh, but just, can I be honest with you a little bit? I've gained a few pounds since I was 17, 18, 19 years old, and running is a lot harder than it used to be. When you pack on a little bit of extra weight, and it doesn't even take a lot, I mean, you, you tend to wear out a lot more quickly. It makes it much harder to overcome the hills and the terrain and the obstacles, you know. As the writer of Hebrews calls on us to think about what it looks like to run our 
race with endurance. It's like, number one, you got to lay aside the things that are holding you back. And there are things that we're carrying through our lives that are going to keep us from, from accomplishing and running in the way that God wants us to run. I don't know about you, but if I've got a race to run, I'm not carrying anything I don't need. And he anticipates what those are going to be. The first one that he tells us about, the first thing that may be in your life that's going to hold you back or cause you to stumble or maybe even cause you a great deal of pain as you attempt to run the race that God has for you is just those things that you know are overtly sinful. The sinful tendencies in your life. You need to know that we have an enemy in this life, the devil, right? And he is here. He's seeking to steal, kill, and to destroy. Rather than you running the race that God has marked out for you and experiencing the joy of walking in faithfulness for your whole life, the enemy wants to trip you up. And he does so in a rather alluring way. He doesn't usually come to you and be like, hey, you know, I, I become a filthy sinner, right? Like, go ruin your life. Like, he doesn't do that. But instead, he entices us with things that look pretty good. Things that, hmm, that might even enrich my life. You know what I mean? Y'all ever, I'm a, I'm a guy, um, and I don't gossip a ton, but sometimes it feels kind of good to hear the, the little juicy tidbits about people. You know what I'm saying? You're like, oh, man, I kind of want to hear that. Like, Maybe it's someone that's made you mad. And you're like, oh, yes, they're struggling or something. Not that that's the righteous approach, but it's how we are. We have a tendency to think, oh, I need to hear that thing. I need to look at that thing. It's going to make me feel better. It's going to enrich my life. And that's what the enemy does. He convinces us that the very things that are going to destroy us are going to make us better. They're going to enrich our life. Uh, several years ago, I heard Craig Rochelle tell a story. He was at a, at a conference speaking he was talking about studying at home, and he has a bunch of kids. And um, it was one of those days, if you have kids, you know how this goes. Uh, they were just in and out, in and out, like always needing something from him, and he's not getting much work done there in his office. And so he tells his son, he's like, hey, I need you to go outside and play. You know, like our parents did to us, they lock us out until dark. So he sends his kid outside to play, and um, things are going well. He's getting some work done. But then as, as a parent, you have this sense in which Things get quiet, and you're like, oh, this could be bad. Like, they're too quiet. Something's going wrong. Um, but as he listens, he hears his, his young son say, my friend, my friend. And he's like, oh, cool. You know, met a neighbor kid. That's great. You know, hopefully things will go well there. But then he hears the front door open, and my friend, my friend, you know. He's like, I guess I need to go meet this child who's now in my house, you know, it's a neighbor kid. I should probably go introduce myself. And as he walks out of his office where he was studying there, he does not see his child with a neighbor kid. But instead, his son had actually found a snake outside. And he would picked it up and brought it in and was like, hey, dad, my friend, my friend. And upon closer inspection, his young son had picked up a juvenile rattlesnake and had brought it into the middle of his living room. And he thinks that it's his, his friend. And so he's going, hey, did you put that down? You know, and then they got to get it out of their house in some way. And by the grace of God, the kid did not get bit by the rattlesnake because that, obviously that would have made for a horrible sermon illustration. But anyway, uh, he, he was okay. And many of us, that's the way Satan operates in our life. He convinces us that something that is really for our destruction is our friend. And we carry those things with us like we need them, like they provide us something when in reality they're only there to bring destruction in our lives. And maybe for you that's an addiction. Maybe for you it's like it's greed or it's the pursuit of money or material things and you think these things are going to make me happy when in reality the enemy wants to use them to destroy your life. So the writer of Hebrews, as he talks to us about how to run our race with perseverance and live this life in which we get to see God work in ways that we never even imagined, he's like, hey, if you're going to run that race, you got to lay aside the things that are going to hold you back, the things that are going to ensnare you and trip you up and weigh you down and make you grow weary. Now, they're the overtly sinful things that can hold us back, but he also says every other thing. Every sort of thing that might hold you back, sometimes the things that keep us from running the race that God has for us, they're not overtly sinful, right? They're not snorting meth, right? They're not that sort of thing, but instead they're things that appear to be good. Maybe it's just a hobby that for some reason grows to enjoy an outsized place of influence in your life. And rather than following after Jesus, you start to pursue the hobby, Maybe it's wanting your kids to be successful 
And you want them to be involved. You want them to learn how to compete on a team. But before long, you haven't been connecting with your church. You haven't been pursuing Jesus because you're chasing your child all over the country pursuing ball or dance or cheer or whatever that thing might be. What the writer challenges us to do here as we seek to run the race that God has marked out for us is to set aside the things that would hinder us and hold us back from giving our lives fully to Jesus Christ. So what does it look like for us to engage missionally and invest in the things that are going to produce a harvest in our life? Number one, we lay aside every weight. Number two, we begin to run our race with endurance. It's interesting. Look here in in chapter 12, verse 2, or in verse 1, I'm sorry. Um, Since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Did you know that in your life, God has marked out a race for you to run? And your race is going to look differently from anyone who's ever lived or ever will live again. Like God has marked out a path for you that he wants you to run, like this course that he wants for you to run in this life, and it is unique to you. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, and he reminds them, he says, we are his workmanship. God has created us and shaped us and formed us. The scriptures tell us that he knit us together in our mother's womb. You have the specific gifts and talents and abilities and ideas, all of who you are. God created you to be that person. And not only that, but God placed you in the family that you're in, even with some of those in-laws. God has given you the career that he's given you. You're attending the school that you're attending. Walk in the circle of friends that you walk in. Live in the neighborhood that you live in. And none of that's by accident. But rather, that is a part of the race that God wants you to run. That he has marked that out for you. And as he created you, he has shaped you and formed you to to perfectly fulfill the purpose that he has for your life. Now, when you think about running a race, it's not aimless. You don't run a race and you're just kind of wandering around, you know. You're running in such a way that you want to win the prize. That's why we race, right? Because we want to win. And yet many people not understanding that God has marked out a race for them to run, that they are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, and it's just kind of wandering through life, wondering why they feel like they have no purpose, wondering why their life isn't fulfilling and satisfying. You were created to run this race, and until you begin to run, you will never fully understand your purpose or have meaning in your life. But there's an important thing I need to tell you about this race. As much as God has shaped you and molded you and given you your talents and abilities and you know, perfectly positioned you in your life to reach the people around you, You can never do that on your own. You can never do that in your own strength. Look what he says here in verse 2. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. Y'all, we don't run in our own strength. We run in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. uh, Just before Jesus ascended into heaven, He'd just gone to the cross. He died on the cross for the sins of the world. He'd risen again on the third day. He gathers his disciples together on top of the mountain there outside of Jerusalem. And he says, "Um, hey, I don't want you guys to go and and do much. I want you to wait right here in Jerusalem. And don't don't go try to run your race. Peter, don't try to preach on the day of Pentecost. And don't try to be my witnesses here and there and everywhere. Don't try to stand in your own strength, but I want you to wait. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive my power. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. And those disciples, all of whom had deserted Jesus when he got arrested just a few weeks before, when the Holy Spirit came upon them with power... They were his bold witnesses anywhere that God might send them. As a matter of fact, um, all of the apostles except for one would ultimately die as martyrs 
or their faith. Men who had just denied Jesus became strengthened and empowered to die as martyrs because of the Holy Spirit. So as you think about the life that God has called you to live, the race that he's called you to run, don't try to do it on your own. Instead, do it in the power of Jesus Christ. There was no one as perfectly positioned or gifted or talented or, or skilled, there is no one so perfectly positioned to reach the people in your circle as you are. But you can't do it in your own strength. You do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. So how do we engage missionally and invest to see a future harvest? We lay aside those things that are going to weigh us down. We begin to run our race with endurance, fixing our eyes on Jesus. And the third thing is we anticipate the prize before us. Look what it says here in, in verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Y'all, when I think about being abandoned by all of your closest friends, being falsely accused in the home of the high priest, they took turns spitting in his face and mocking him, striking him. Well, you're a prophet, and why don't you tell us who hit you? He was beaten beyond recognition. Stripped naked, a crown of thorns driven into his skull, stretched out his arms. There on the cross, they drove the nails through his wrists and his ankles. And there on the cross, Jesus died and agonizing death. And if I'm being honest, none of that sounds like joy to me. And yet Jesus could endure the cross for the joy set before him because he understood the prize, because he understood what he was accomplishing. That Jesus Christ loved you. And Jesus Christ loved me enough to, have, to joyfully endure the cross. That we wouldn't have to die for our sins, but instead we could live a full and abundant life in Him. That we could be reconciled to God. Jesus joyfully went to the cross. He knew your name. He knew the number of hairs on your head. He knew all of your mistakes and your failures your weaknesses. He knew that you would rebel against him, that you and I would not always represent him very well. As a matter of fact, we would totally blow it at times. Bring shame on the name of God. And yet, in love and with joy in his heart, he died on the cross for you that you might find new life in him. And just as Jesus could have joy in suffering on the cross, you and I can endure difficulties as we run our race, even when it's time to suffer. We can endure those difficult times with joy in our hearts because we're looking ahead to the harvest. For those Dust Bowl era farmers to take what little wheat seed they had, and rather than using it to feed their families, they sowed it into their field. They did so in a hope that more would be produced in the end, that they would see a harvest that would not only feed feed their families, but would also save their farms and secure their futures. And for you and I, we joyfully endure whatever it is that is in our path as we run the race that Jesus has marked out for us, because we're looking forward to a harvest. And for you, maybe it's just an ongoing prayer for that person in your life that God has placed in your family or in your friend group or in your, you know, your office suite that you're saying, God, would you do something in them? God, would you use me, little old me, right? Would you use me to, to sow seeds of the gospel in their life that might bear fruit? And not just in them, but that families could be transformed, that generations could be reshaped, that maybe even this community could be different because you used me as I ran my race, offering myself, saying, God, I want to engage in mission. I want to run the race that you've marked out for me. And God, I look ahead to the prize. What does it look like for us to invest to see a harvest? We throw off the things that weigh us down. We begin to run our race with endurance. And we joyfully anticipate the prize before us. We serve a God who gave his life for us. Who joyfully endured the cross that we might find new life. 
If we're following Jesus, we too run the race that he's marked out for us, offering ourselves in service to him and anticipate what he might do in and through our lives. Would you bow with me? Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus and the sacrifice that he offered up on the cross. That for men and women like me, who sinned against you, who have blown it in, in more ways than I can even count, men and women who had nothing to offer you, Father, that you died for us, demonstrating how profound your divine love is for each of us. Lord, I pray for the person who's here today that doesn't know you. I pray that today would be the day of salvation, the day that they see how much you loved them, the day that they follow you in faith. Lord, for those of us who are in this room who are, who are already believers, I pray that we would begin to live our lives engaging missionally, investing every single day and every single moment, sowing into your kingdom and hoping for a harvest. God, would you use us for your glory in our community? And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.